Hi, my name is Justin Lanier from the University of Chicago. This is part two of my talk, the end of outreach for NCNGT 2021 for the, the session beyond the chalkboard topology through outreach. Uh, in, in part one, I described some about uh, my, my own personal encounters with math outreach, both in the past and the present. Um, in, in this uh, second part of the talk, I'm gonna say some about um, what, I, what I'm looking forward to or interested in, in terms of the, the future of math outreach, um, and also to state some things as, as open problems in math outreach. Um, uh, not necessarily well-formed and not, not all necessarily sort of, sort of problems, but maybe like some suggestions for, 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 for kinds of efforts that I'd like to see. Um, some of them, I, I hope to work on them on myself. Uh, but I also really hope that the other folks will, will, will carry some of these projects forward. Um, okay, so first, um, a, a little bit of, of survey time in, in terms of uh, uh, thinking about uh, what the math world is like and also what, uh, what maybe the future of math might be like. So here, here are a couple of questions to reflect on yourself. Uh, what, what percentage of Americans would you say are engaged in the production of math research currently? And then what, what percentage of Americans uh, follow the, the process of math research in the way that you might, I don't know, follow sports or, uh, you know, follow the news or, or something like this, or they, you know, know something about what math research is going on. Uh, and then like what percentage of American adults would identify as math interested? I mean, you think to yourself, some numbers for those. Um, so here, here are my answers of what I, what I think is going on. Uh, so I think I think basically zero percent of Americans are engaged in producing math research. Uh, I mean it's it's not zero percent, but the the number of research mathematicians, even if you include, um, you know, undergraduate researchers, um, it's 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 basically zero, right? Like um, there's there's some small number of thousands of people, maybe ten thousand, maybe twenty thousand, um, but in terms of the American population, it's it's vanishingly small. Uh, and I think I think the same is true for the number of Americans who who follow math research. I'll, I'll you know this is with some caveats that I'll come back to in a moment. But um, um, there there are many you know there are many complicated things that um, you know um, Americans do follow, right? Like sports are pretty complicated and politics is pretty complicated. Um, but the you know the the, the sort of uh, both interest and uh, uh, venues and culture around mathematics um, means that not very many people uh, follow what's going on in math research. Um, the number of American adults who are math interested is is not zero percent or even close to zero percent. I have no idea what the what the exact number is. You know, maybe it's five percent or ten percent or thirty percent or two percent. I don't I don't I don't really know. Um, but the the point is that. Um, you know, if, if presented with some kind of interesting update about how math research is going, um, it, would, it would not be a hard sell at all um, to, get, to get folks interested. A, a good measure of this is there are all kinds of, um, you know, math popularization accounts on YouTube and Twitter and so forth. Um, and, and these get, you know, many thousands and even millions of views. Um, and so there, there are people out there who, who, um, who, are, who would, it would not take any great deal of convincing to be more engaged in, in math research or math enrichment or in, in math culture and community. Uh, okay, so a couple more questions. Um, so what percentage of Americans have the capacity to produce math research? Um, so this is more of the, the first question is about what is actually the case. And this one is, is, a, is more of a hypothetical. Um, and then uh, what percentage of Americans have the, have the capacity to follow math research? That is that they sort of have the wherewithal um, or the background or the, um, you know, the time or energy or, or what have you, whatever you think capacity means. Um, and, the, and the final this last question is where, where does most math in the USA happen? So maybe you'll think about those questions. And uh, here, here are my answers. Um, so, so basically 100% of Americans could make research comp contributions in math. Like I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about edge cases of you know, people who are in persistent vegetative states, but you know, it's, it's, it's virtually 100% of people like math. Well, I'll say, I'll say it later, you know, math research is hard, but it's, 
it's not it's not that hard, right? Like there's 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 work that that people can do. There's work that they can get invested in and excited about. Um, this is this is well within the reach of of everybody. That's just something that I think is true, and I'm curious to know what what other people think. Um, and then, of course, similarly for following math research, like I, I don't think that they're you know special math people uh, or only people with certain prior experiences or, or prior knowledge could could find uh, you know math research news of math research to be exciting. Uh, and then this last question, I, I, I guess the, the the rhetorical import of it is when when you're inside of math research, the the community of math research, like everyone's a mathematician, everyone's producing math research and it, and it feels like you know sort of the whole world like you're you're living inside of this world uh, but it's it's important to remember that like basically you know the amount of the amount of people hours spent doing math um way by far way most of it uh, is happening in in, in k-12 classrooms i mean some some significant chunk is happening in in college and university classrooms but uh in terms of we're sort of like you know, if you zoomed out, right, if you got a coarse picture of where math is happening, like, right, if aliens, if aliens were just like had some telescope, they're like, where's, where's all the math happening? It would, you know, it would be seventh graders and third graders and, and their teachers making math happen. So it's, it, I think it's important to have that sort of zoomed out perspective. Oh, so uh, about this following math research, um, it, it's, you know, not a lot of Americans follow math research, but in the last five and 10 years, I think there's been a lot of progress in, um, in, in making that possible. Uh, so a couple of noteworthy examples are the, the infinite series um, put out by, by PBS um, that you can find on YouTube. There's, there's Quantum Magazine, whose um, uh, articles about recent research breakthroughs are really fantastic. Um, I, I often find out about what's new and happening in the math world through, through Quanta, either through, through other means. Uh, and the, the, the blog, the A Periodical, is another fantastic, um, it's, they, it's sort of a, a, a wider ranging blog, but they, they also include updates about, about, about math research. So there, there's starting to be venues where people can access information about contemporary math research. Um, okay, so this is just a sort of a little bit of a laundry list about uh, what I think our outreach responsibilities are um, as, as mathematicians, as people in math academia. Um, so one dichotomy I want to put up there is that um, one way of thinking about what mathematicians do is that we, we sort of tend, tend to flame, right, in, in the sort of ancient temple sense of like, all right, we got to keep this fire burning for generations upon generations. If we, if we don't do this work, if we don't keep this alive, that it'll just you know crumble and fall to pieces, and we'll we'll lose this piece of of human culture. Um, and I think that, you know there there are ways in which that's that's very true. Uh, but there's a there's an opposite tendency whenever you have you know uh, an inside group um, you know keeping track of something they think is important that it, it can end up turning into a certain amount of hoarding, where you think the the most labyrinthine. Uh, you know, and esoteric parts of, of what's going on are, are what's essential and, and forgetting that the, um, you know, or, or sort of believing that no one who's not completely, totally 100% initiated uh, could possibly care or be interested or engage with what's going on. Like uh, thinking, oh, you want to do math research, well, you better have a PhD or you, you know, you need to be a part of an REU or et cetera. Right. I mean, even, you know, this about REUs, you know, 30 years ago, the notion that undergraduates could do research uh, was a, not a, not so widely uh, agreed to as, as it is today. Um, so I, th I think uh, we have to be careful about, about hoarding as we do our, our tending. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's important that we find ways to support non-academics outreach work. Um, so uh, a lot of the, the organizing of festivals and fairs and um, other kinds of outreach events. Some of those happen at universities, but they're often carried about carried out by K-12 teachers or by nonprofits who are, that are not necessarily run by academics. Uh, and so finding ways of, of partnering with uh, those institutions or, or with those communities uh, is, is really important. Uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here, uh, but we can, we can certainly help to, um, to shoulder the burden. Um, I think it's important that we repay our, our funding allowance, right? So the, 
the math community gets a, a lot of a lot of money through the the National Science Foundation, um, and there are these uh, there are these broader impacts that um, we we propose as part of our our work to to be funded, um, and I think this is something that um, I mean often this is this is taken quite seriously by folks, but uh, I think I think we owe the public a, a big return on on the money that they invest in uh, not only original research but in um, like maintaining the the culture of mathematics um, and to to think that they won't be interested or that they they that they won't that they won't care or they can't engage um, is is sort of hubris on our on our part. Um, uh, it's it's unclear why you know. For every, I'll say more about this later. Um, for, for every conference that we have, uh, why, why could there not be a public component of that or an outreach component of that? Or for every paper we produce, why is there not an attempt to, to popularize it um, in, in some medium or mode or venue? Um, I, I think um, it's number four, viewing departments as local resource centers. Um, I, I think, uh, like, did I ever? visit or interact with the, the math department at my local university growing up. Maybe, maybe there are ways in which that happened. Uh, like I never took a field trip there or something, but maybe they held a program once or twice and I got to benefit from it. Um, but I, I think, uh, I think uni university and college math departments, and again, this is not throwing any shade and lots of people do lots of, lots of good work, but really conceiving these as not we're going to outreach to you sometimes, but rather this is a center of mathematics in our city or in our town, um, and we're here to you know the, the, there should be an overflowing of that um, of that richness to to the wider community rather than you know sort of sometimes and maybe a little begrudgingly like like handing out some morsels. Um, I think. Uh, I think we should have more energetic public facing professional societies. I think there's a lot of a lot of work and a lot of events and um, a lot of positive public relations for the subject with the general public um, that the AMS and the MAA, uh, AWM and so forth could take on. Um, there, there are some of these that are there's some there's some ways in which this is already being done. Like I'm I'm a big fan of AWM's uh, annual essay contest. Uh, I think this uh, they they pair up um, women in mathematics, whether those are school teachers or university professors, um, with elementary, middle, and high schoolers, or middle, high, and college students. I forget. Uh, and then the student writes an essay about this woman who's a mathematician. So not only do they get to interact with this person, but they get to learn about their story and their journey in math. And I think that's a that's a great way of, of promoting engagement. Uh, I, I just think there's there's like just tons more that that could happen. That I would be really excited to see. Uh, and then finally, in terms of outreach, so I alluded to this before, I saw with uh, with subgroups and with paradigms that part of outreach needs to be taking care of our own, taking care of um, graduate students, taking care of people who are entering graduate school, uh, and maybe. Uh, something that is not not mentioned so much. So there there are lots of folks who enter graduate school and then graduate, and then that's the end of being a part of the math research community for them, or they drop out along the way. Um, and I think finding ways of continuing to engage with those folks and helping them to be a part of the community um, is is really a part of our responsibility. Um, okay. Okay, so maybe on this this last point, I'll start with the quote on the bottom. This is from a essay, essay by AMS Vice President Francis Su um, toward the end of last year, where he says that according to the AMS annual survey, you have these 3,600 folks enter, entering math PhD programs, but only about 1,900 folks finish each year, and that's like half. And like that doesn't sound like a very good success rate. And you might say, oh, well, people leave because they go on to pursue different paths. Um, and that's fine. Like certainly there's a there's an amount of, you know, people are figuring out their lives and what's going to work for them personally and professionally. Um, but it, it it makes one think, or makes me at least think, like, what are the ways in which we can restructure graduate programs where uh, it doesn't feel like half the people are dropping out, right? There, there's got to be different ways of 
shaping programs, of giving information in terms of recruitment, um, of mentoring people and, and guiding people when they're when they're in programs. And then this 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 upper image was shared by Bill Velez um, at the Fall Paradigms Conference, and it just it shows the distribution of the total numbers of paper by author like over their career. So these are folks who have gotten PhDs, and um, the the majority of uh, people who get PhDs in math they end up publishing one or two papers. Uh, those are in blue and orange. Um, and so this is showing how uh, even for the folks who make it all the way sort of to the center of the circle in the sense that, you know, they, they've, they have found their way into graduate school, um, for, for the folks who graduate, which is only half, like only half again, sort of continue to, to produce new mathematics during the rest of their career. Um, and this is, um, this feels disappointing to me or disenchanting or like one would hope for, for better than this. Um, um, okay, so uh, 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 about, about that. So math has many off ramps, right? There are lots of places in, in one's education or life where, all right, well, I, don't, I don't understand fractions, so math isn't for me, or I don't understand algebra, and so math isn't for me, or like, you know, I didn't do well in the AP calculus exam or my first college math course or graduate school is too hard. Or there's just, there's a lots, there's lots of ways that, that people decide that math is not for them. And they're, they're not, they're comparatively few on ramps, right? Where someone at some point they're like, oh, math, math isn't for me. Oh, but look, here's this opportunity for me to re-engage or to try something out in a low stakes way or to, to get excited about, you know, some little wrinkle, some little piece of math. Uh, uh, and I wish they were more on ramps. Um, another thought is that uh, intrinsically math is not so different from other uh, human activities, some of which that are far are far more popular. Uh, so when, whenever I was at Georgia Tech and you're right, there are these weekend football events where there are thousands and thousands of people coming and watching a game um, that, you know, like maybe some of them really know what's going on but like I've watched football for a long time and I don't really know what's going on right but the the experience of, of of watching the game is part of the excitement but also like being a part of a group and you 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 know you uh you tailgate ahead of time like can you imagine a math event that felt like a college football game or like an arts event or you know none, none of the I'm not holding any of these pieces of culture up as you know the thing to shoot for, but it, you know it's certainly the case that some things are 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 very popular, uh, and you know watching someone share some math is like not orders of magnitude less interesting than you know watching people hit a baseball, in my opinion. Like you know not everyone has to agree with that, but I, I think I think there's room for you know math events to be much more popular. Uh, I said this before. I'll say it again. Uh, we all know that doing math research is hard, but it's also not that hard. Like there's, you know, there are ways of, there are all kinds of problems, big and small. There are all kinds of progress, big and small. There are all kinds of coll research collaborations where the contributions can be big or small. And, uh, but to be involved in such a thing is very exciting and very identity forming and can lead to next steps. And I, I think that's something that we should um, admit to ourselves more. Uh, and I think uh, we, need to spend more time thinking about how we can capture the power of the routine and the virtual and the globally visible. Um, so by the routine, uh, I, I think it's uh, important, it's important not just to have one-off experiences available for people, right? Like the, the amount of things that happen between certain events, like you have a math festival one day a year, um, it's really hard for a person to like sort of feel a connection all the way from the first event all the way until the until the next one. And so having not only many entry points, but like sort of peppered all, all the time where there, where there are um, new opportunities or constant opportunities available, I think is, is important. Uh, I think over the over the last year, we've we've all had experiences of uh, of virtual environments um, that are, you know, maybe not as good as. Um, but maybe in some ways superior to uh, in-person events. Uh, I think there's plenty for us to chew on about what that entails for our own future in math outreach. Um, and I, 
I, I think um, this is related to the professional societies having having events that are that are globally visible are that you know in the way that in the way that something like Pi Day is something that is something that's just known that lots and lots of people have have heard of. Um, you would want sort of outreach initiatives to have that level of um, po popular recognition and and not um, and not something that you have to have sort of specialized knowledge or tapped into some particular network to be to be aware of. Okay, so then I'm going to run through some open problems and then uh, that'll that'll be the end. Uh, I don't have tons to say about about most of them, but I just want to point out in some directions and I'll, I'll be curious and interested to, to chat with folks about them. Um, so number one, I think we need to find ways to build and strengthen local math communities. So this is like thinking of uh, a university or college math department as a as a cultural center or a community center, um, finding ways of um, you know, having mathematicians go into classrooms, having classrooms come to um, to math departments. So there's a, a wonderful initiative by um, Salvi Cara and Patty Booster uh, called Meet a Mathematician, which is a collection of, of, of video interviews. And um, this is not to not to steal their name or, or what have you, uh, but having having like a national day or week where mathematicians they're just like go you know having having partner classrooms and getting to tell them a little bit about their work. Like it's a little crazy that people spend 12 years doing math and uh, you know, five days a week and they never, they never meet a mathematician. Um, I didn't meet one until you know, after college. Um, it's just not, it's not a persona or a, you know, a profession that one reads about in, like in children's books so much. Like, oh, here's a fireman, you know, here's a nurse, here's the baker. Uh, but mathematician often doesn't show up. All right, so that, that's that's one kind of open problem. How do we how do we build and strengthen lo local math communities centered um, in our in our math departments? Um, I mentioned these math encounters that the Museum of Math does. There are these popular popular lectures. They they were in person uh, previously, but over the last year they they've gone virtual. Um, they are really engaging popular popularize public talks. Um, and it would be wonderful if these were, you know, streamed into classrooms or like there were flyers going out about these happening all the time or if AMS were sponsoring it. So having, having um, you know, leveraging um, opportunities to, to have, uh, you know, virtual popularized um, sort of, you know, in person in the sense that you're in a room with a bunch of, a virtual room with a bunch of people and getting sort of the community spirit um, but all done virtually. Um, I, I, I think something that ought to be tried more is we have, as mathematicians, we have lots of math conferences all over the country and world, um, and they tend not to have any kind of outreach session connected to them. Um, I, this, this seems disappointing to me, right? Like we're spending, we're spending a bunch of money to pull a bunch of people together to have an event, um, often at public expense. Um, and we're we're not we're not engaging the public at all with them. So, um, and these could, these could be thematic. They can help to focus and draw people in to uh, connection and community with their their respective math departments. Uh, I think this is a, a promising direction. Um, I had this idea recently that I'm, I'm excited about and that I maybe I'll I'll try at some point. This notion of a of a online math pop up, which is some kind of combination of a of math popularization, but also a, a research startup. Um, so uh, I recently got interested in um, um, this, this problem about the double pendulum. And I, I saw uh, a friend of mine, uh, Paul Solomon shared this image on Facebook, um, which is like the parameter space for a double pendulum and how long it takes for it to first time flip over. Anyway, I thought this was so cool. And then I shared this video on Twitter that I had run across and trying to dig in more. And then um, this got tweeted by a, by a math YouTuber. And there were lots and lots of people who thought this, you know, this visualization was so cool. And I just, I think it would be really neat to have math events that were combinations of being public facing where they were introducing sort of a math problem um, to a wide public that could be interested in the problem, but also sort of to the wide community of mathematicians um, that can maybe trying to, to tackle the problem. And then you have a ready-made public audience that would be interested in the progress um, 
of, of what's going on there. And so this is, this is similar to the notion of, a, of the polymath projects um, spearheaded by Terry Tao and Tim Gowers, um, but maybe a little less technical in terms of the, the math that's being conducted and then having this, um, this sort of popularization push. Um, I'm, I'm really big uh, and would really, I'm really big on and would love to see more work done in the direction of building research experiences for teachers. There are thousands and thousands of, of math teachers out there and just a tiny handful of concerted efforts to um, uh, help them help them grow um, as mathematicians. Um, there's more than, than on this list here, but I'll, I've mentioned Promise for Teachers at BU a number of times. Um, there was this project um, at the University of Minnesota in the early 90s by uh, John Conway and Peter Doyle, Jane Gilman and Bill Thurston, where they, for two weeks, they, they sort of ran this course that Conway and Thurston had done at Princeton, uh, but just for a range of folks from high schoolers and uh, high school and college teachers, just a bunch of different people. Um, I think that's that's another that's another model. And then I, I want to shout out to the there there are a couple of these REUs that are um, really RETs, including at Illinois State, um, where they do math research like an REU, but specifically for folks who are going to be in classroom in, in K twelve classrooms. Um, so yeah, there should be lots more um, of, the, of that being done. That they're, they're, yeah, it's just a, 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 a really untapped uh, audience slash community. Like, um, I would love to see, you know, our, our math, you know, our, the, math, you know, the university math research community having as partners research mathematicians who are teaching at high schools. Like, that should just be a common thing 20 and 50 years from now. Uh, I, in terms of outreach, more less public facing and more towards the community, we really need better resources of information about graduate programs for both for prospective students uh, and for current administrators. Uh, so one effort in this direction is, is this recent survey, survey by, by Emily Wen, who's a grad student at Brown, uh, just knowing what qualifying exams are like at various schools. Like it's, it's not, that, that information is not currently readily available in any sort of um, combined form. So I, I think we, we as a community have work to do either uh, in within or uh, outside of major professional organizations of finding ways of getting uh, more robust information about our graduate programs to the people who need that information. Um, uh, a, much, a, much bigger, a much bigger picture uh, kind of thing to do is just, I think there need to be a wider range of math grad school program types um, most grad programs, I mean, they're, we need to know sort of how they are different from each other, uh, but I think there's room for major experimentation. Um, like, what, what, what I wrote here, what is the last math break, last breakthrough in math graduate education? Uh, I don't, I, I can't really think of, of any. I would be curious to hear what people think about that. Uh, on the incoming end, right, for designed for undergraduates, REUs like I mentioned before, are a relatively recent innovation in terms of um, them being a very common practice uh, and directed reading programs for undergraduates, um, especially in departments that have math research programs. These are innovations on the, the sort of training and enculturation of, of math undergraduates. But um, yeah, what, what could math grad programs look like? Like, why isn't there or why can't there be more math graduate programs pitching themselves to more narrow audiences, right? Like I want to be uh, a professor at a liberal arts college, and then I can go to a math graduate program that was geared toward producing uh, graduates um, with, 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 that, with that outcome. The preparation of such people uh, could, be, could be better if, it were, if they were at a, at a more tailored uh, focused program. For instance, um, I think I think there's there's lots of work, particularly by the AMS, but also more generally, for there to be outreach to new graduate students. So so subgroups is is one effort in this endeavor. Um, uh, another endeavor that happened this past year is this RFAM uh, conference that provides resources to undergraduates who are considering graduate school. Uh, that's that's 
been coordinated and run by um, a team of current undergraduates. Um, but, it, but here's a here's the thing that the AMS I think is thinking about some, which is similar to what NCTM for the K, in the K twelve world was thinking about whenever I was more in that world, which is just uh, how do we get the new generation of uh, of people in the community to be involved in the professional organization? How do we make sure that they don't just like opt out of being a part of the AMS? And I think part of it is that the AMS does not do a particularly good job of introducing the AMS and its work to graduate students. What is the AMS for? What work does it do? How can one get involved? And I think having some kind of professional development opportunity during the beginning of grad school, you know, something virtual where the AMS is, you know, educating its, you know, future membership with like how they can be involved, what the work is, so that it's not just, hey, here's a magazine once a month that your school is paying for. So that it's a very passive and also a very, what am I getting out of the AMS? As opposed to, you know, you know, sort of the ask not what you can do, what the AMS can do for you, but what you can do for the AMS, right? If you're going to be a professional, you you want you want to be left with the impression, hey, if you're going to be a math professional, you want to be involved in your professional society, and I, I don't think that sentiment exists so very much, and I don't think the AMS is particularly doing the work to help make that happen. All right, just a couple more. Um, this is very broad. I think inside of you know even inside of a standard math graduate program, thinking about what one's first research project should be and whether that should be by yourself or with other people and scaffolding what it means to eventually do math research, um, not having it so that people produce one or two pieces of math research and then never do again, and how you structure math research communities to make that happen. Uh, I think there's lots to think about there, uh, including how math research um, you know, fields organize themselves. So I, I really thought well of this big services seminar that you know got put together this year um, where inside of this research community that I, I'm, a, I'm a member of or you know that I, I've done I've done research in getting to see on a regular basis the people in this field and hearing about the work that they're they're in progress on or completing is just a very different experience than I had ever before inside of a research field so I think that's an interesting and fruitful direction and then finally uh, I just think there ought to be more adult education opportunities um, at universities, at local libraries, at local schools. I mentioned this 19th century math class that I taught to some adults. There's there's all kinds of people who could have a new, fresh um, experience with math, even if their last math class was 10 or 50 years ago, um, where they can come and find something new in the subject that resonates with them in new and maybe uh, more exciting ways. Uh, and then, of course, there are many other open problems. Uh, I hope that we will continue to, to pose them, uh, and I look forward to discussing them during uh, these questions and others during the conference. All right, thanks very much.